Stephanie. Welcome to All Over Again podcast. I'm so glad you're here. I'm so happy to be here. I feel like I remember the day you shared you had this vision and idea of the podcast you wanted to start it and now to see it come to fruition and being here with you. I'm just so grateful. So congrats on everything, Natalie. Well, thank you. And I'm so grateful because you helped me entree into this space and and actually introduced me to Ginny Media. So thank you for helping me launch all over again. Of course. It's huge. We're excited. Okay. So we're going to jump right in. What gets you out of bed in the morning, Stephanie? There's a few things that get me out of bed in the morning. One, of course, my little miracle daughter, Molly, and just being there for her and, and doing everything with her. And two, the the business that I've built, especially with entrepreneurs and just helping and empowering founders every single day, I get so excited to get down into my office every single day and connect with other women and, you know, make impact and help people. And I know we were chatting right before we started recording that I'm very tired this morning because I was up late trying to learn a new platform so I can help others learn how to use it to help their business. So it keeps me up at night and gets me out of bed in the morning. (laughs) Well, I love that you're ahead of all of the trends and that you are our cheat sheet into that space. So actually, you had just introduced me to this new platform. Why don't you share what that is? Because I feel like I just learned about it myself from you. Of course. So it's brand new. Meta released a new platform yesterday called Threads. And essentially, it's like Twitter, but for all of your friends on Instagram. So basically, they've essentially copied the the app, copied Twitter and how you use Twitter. And they even named it Threads, which is so interesting because on Twitter, it's a thread as well. Um, so they're really just like going in hard after Twitter. And what I see it as is, is this clean opportunity to have this like beautiful white space. You're starting a brand new account. You can start having longer form conversations with your Instagram followers, and you can build these deeper connections that I felt before you were able to have those and build those connections on Instagram. And it's one of the ways we even built an even deeper connection through Instagram direct message. But now you can have all of those conversations really publicly over on threads. So that's my take on it so far. Interesting. But do you really want to have all of your conversations out for the world to see? I think that's curious. Yeah. I mean, I think it just depends on your goals, right? Your business goals, your life goals, what you're looking to accomplish with this platform. So I think the way I would advise anyone in business, especially when even jumping on a new platform, like I always say, like jump in, like play around, like see what's happening, watch and observe and see if it fits in with your specific business goals. You know, what are you looking to accomplish? What would success look like to you? You might not need to be on a new platform, But you might. And it really depends on what your goals are. So if you're looking to have these, you know, deeper connections and conversations with your customers, with your clients, you can easily have those over on threads because they've made it very easy to be able to just move all of your Instagram followers right over to to threads. So they they did the opposite of what Clubhouse did. So when Clubhouse launched, Clubhouse essentially made it this like private, you had to get an invite, everyone was like trying to get in. And here they've made it accessible. I mean, there's, you know, millions of new users on this platform within 24 hours. It's like the fastest uh, app platform has ever, has ever grown. I'll have to check it out. sounds like you're pretty excited about it. So I'm, I'm, it's enticing. I'm going to jump in. I mean, you jump in, you see, you observe, give it a whirl and we'll see, uh, ask me a week from now. Let's see what's going on. (laughs) I will. I'm going to ask you in a week from now. Okay. So I have more questions to ask you about the segue from your professional and your personal life and vice versa. But first I have to ask the burning question. If you had a chance at a redo of any experience, what would you do all over again and why? I would start my business, Social Flyer, very first business, all over again. I would absolutely do it. And I would not do anything differently because 
everything we learned in the early days of first launching our business, we have been able to take all of those learning lessons to continue to build. And it's what really got us to where we are today now, you know, being co-founders of multiple businesses. And we knew nothing when we first started, Natalie, like nothing. We didn't know anything about launching and growing and scaling a business. We figured it out as we went along. And I actually look back and I'm like, if we knew everything that we knew now, would we have started the business? Maybe not. So being naive and not knowing everything when, when first starting a business, I actually think is the best. You don't know what you don't know. There's nothing so scary to hold you back, right? Mm -hmm. Well, you had me fooled because I thought you had it figured out the entire time. So whatever you faked until you made, it worked. And as far as in your personal life, like we met through your, we met actually professionally when I was at Audi and you had launched Social Fly. I was curious about how to integrate the world of influencers and my brand, not my brand, but the brand. It felt like my brand at, mm -hmm. at times, but we were talking about that. But then we reconnected through our own women's health and, and fertility journeys. So is there anything, when you look at those journeys, is there anything that you would do all over again? Or would you do everything exactly the same knowing what you know now? Knowing what I know now, I would not do it all over the same. I would actually do it very differently, um, having experienced a, you know, a lot of challenges going through my infertility journey and then even more challenges once we were finally pregnant with my pregnancy journey. I would do it very differently um, if we decide to move forward with the next time. And that's what we're, we're still, <laughs> we're still going back and forth on all of that because of everything that we went through. It was so hard. You know, I, I wish I knew more before we first started our, going through our challenges with infertility because it was so hard when I didn't know anything. And I built community and connection. It's how we reconnected by sharing. I, I wish back then there was more information available and now there is like, there's so much information. I feel like that's out there now. There, there wasn't this type of connection community when we were first going through everything. At least I couldn't find it initially. I couldn't either. No, it, it really was sort of these hidden pockets because the stigma was so much greater around infertility that you didn't want to talk about it because then it was almost like, at least for me, admitting mm -hmm. that, wow, there's something wrong with me. Because here you are, this this rock star in your professional career that's killing it, right? And you're doing all of the things and you're accomplishing all of the things without having read all of the books mm -hmm. and done all of the things. I mean, sure, you went to school and did, but what I mean is there was no like book that told you what to do, especially in sort of this landmark you know, space of social. And so you built it, but then when it came to your personal life, right, it was very different. Like mm -hmm. reading the books and what have you, first of, all, first of all, there weren't any real books to read outside of it all starts with the egg, mm -hmm. right? And even then, it, that wasn't exactly like the most, it, it didn't tell us everything. So knowing what you know now, what would be the biggest resource that you would say like, okay, if you're starting out in your fertility journey or, or pregnancy, what have you, like what, maybe there are two questions. What would you want to tell somebody that's starting out on their infertility journey? And what would you want to tell somebody that is starting out on their, their pregnancy journey that they should know mm -hmm. that you didn't know that we didn't have access to? The first thing for someone that's starting their infertility journey is that there, I want them to know there are resources and you can find the answers. And if you go to a fertility clinic and you are not having a great experience with them, you're not stuck there. There are other doctors. There are other resources. You don't just have to pick one path and stay there forever. If something isn't working, like it's okay. There are other resources for you. And there are people that have likely been through your what you're going through as well, who are willing to help if you ask for that help. Something that I started doing as we were going through our journey with infertility is I did finally start sharing what we were going through 
publicly on my social media. And that's how I started uncovering resources because I started publicly sharing, you know, my questions and what was going on and people then who had been through it. It was basically like I was crowdsourcing my journey to get help and get information because a Google search wasn't coming up with the answers that I needed, but people that had similar or genuine experiences could help me navigate what I was personally going through. So I learned there are so many people that are going through this or have already been through it and people are willing to help if you just reach out and ask for it. Absolutely. And you've been very open and it's interesting because you talk about crowdsourcing, right? Because a lot of the times when you go on this journey, there's it's it's a double-edged sword. Sometimes you're looking for information and sometimes you're not looking for unsolicited advice. So it's interesting because you use social, which was your professional bread and butter, to crowdsource the information that you really needed. So it's a really nice compliment to what you did mm -hmm. personally and professionally. Um, when you were looking for all of these different sort of ways to support you, was there an aha moment when you said, wow, this, I wish I had known this one thing, like this one particular piece of information was a game changer for me and I wish I'd known it sooner. The biggest thing I learned throughout the entire journey from infertility to dealing with a complicated pregnancy was that doctors are, I believe, I genuinely believe they're trying to do the best that they can do with the knowledge and information that they have, but sometimes they don't have all of the answers. They haven't had the experience. They don't have all of that specific knowledge and information for what you're going through. And just because they don't necessarily have all the answers, it doesn't mean it's like the end of the, the end of the rope and there's, there's no answers left. There are other people who have that information, have those answers and it's up to you really to be your own best advocate and be empowered to go find that information. And I know so badly, we just want to feel, okay, if we go to this doctor, they're going to solve all of the problems. They're the expert. They have all of the answers. They know everything. They know everyone. They're going to just take care of it. And while so badly you want to, you know, believe that and just put it in someone else's hands. Ultimately, at the end of the day, you're always going to be your own best advocate and you have to keep driving that ship forward to the end destination and find that supportive crew and team and, you know, having a great doctor and friends and family and these other resources, they're all part of your, you know, all part of your crew, but you do have to be the one to lead that ship and be empowered to listen to that intuition inside of you. If something doesn't feel right. It probably isn't, and it's okay to change course and find the other right people who need to be on that on that ship with you. Because we know our bodies better than anyone else, right? Yes. And you shared about intuition, and your intuition seemed to really have guided you throughout the journey to Molly mm -hmm. and during your pregnancy. Would you mind sharing a little bit about your experience and when your intuition really became sort of your, your bellwether, it became your, your constant and you said, wow, I need to do this. So could you share a little bit about your journey? Absolutely. So I'll try to give the Cliff Notes version, but um, so we had a very complicated time trying to uh, initially get pregnant. So Lots of things, lots of things happened, but maybe I won't go into all of those details, but we finally did. We finally got pregnant and we ended up doing IVF. So we put in one embryo and the embryo ended up splitting. So we were initially pregnant with identical twin girls. And I did have an intuition that the embryo split as well early on. I had this feeling and I told everyone and then we had an ultrasound and confirmed that. So that was like the first sign. Like you just know, you just know, <laughs> you just listen to that feeling, not just the voice inside of you, but like that feeling in your heart. So I just knew, you know, everything that I was like feeling, even going through the infertility journey and then finally getting pregnant, these things were just like happening. I just knew in my body. So then um, we had a lot of complications early on in the pregnancy with a lot of bleeding and a hematoma and things started happening early on. Felt like we were miscarrying multiple times from, you know, lots of blood and things that were happening, was rushed to the hospital, all sorts of things. Those were just in the first like 12 weeks of pregnancy. Oh, so scary. 
Awful, like awful. And then at 16 weeks, um, we I, we went in for the early anatomy scan of both of the girls, and we found out that we had um, the early signs of twin to twin transfusion. And there was a few other things that they saw um, in there. The one of our baby's cords was not attached properly. Basically, every complication we had initially heard about from um, the doctor at about 12 weeks when we had moved on to our, our, um, our OB who specialized in, in twin pregnancies. I remember he shared a bunch of these things that can happen. And I, I like stopped him. I was like, please don't speak those into the universe. Like, I don't even want to hear them. Like I got so nervous, even just hearing that these things could happen. And they did. And basically all of the things that he listed that could happen at that appointment at 12 weeks, we were getting the whole list of everything at 16 weeks that they saw in that in that ultrasound. And we had to make really fast and quick decisions at 16 and a half weeks when we found out we had twin to twin transfusion. You know, the options we were given right away from the doctor were, you know, you can um, you know, shoot, some people choose to terminate one of your babies to try to save the other baby. You could do nothing, but they likely both won't survive if this progresses, or we can do um, this uh, laser ablation surgery. And just in that moment, hearing these options of like these choices that we were going to have to make so quickly. And for me being someone who I need the information, I need to research, I need to talk to people, but feeling almost pressure, like we had to make a decision like right then in that moment was just horrible. And going back to like, you know, being in the business mindset too, I was literally being supposed to be picked up from that appointment by a car to go speak at an event for a major credit card company. (laughs) So here I am now, like, we're being told all of this horrible news. I'm here with my husband, um, trying to like bring problem solve for business, trying to problem solve like my child's lives and the rest of our lives in that moment. It's like, what do you, what do you do in those moments? And I, I went to social media. I literally, you know, the doctor left the room and I'm going in this Facebook group and I'm sharing what's going on to like get quick information of what to do, because here I am with one doctor he has the information of just what he knows, but I had already learned from everything we went through in our fertility journey. We need to, I need more information from people who've actually been through this. I need to talk to someone who's been through this. This doctor has never been in my body. I need, I need to talk to another mom who's been through this to help me through this. And that's what I did. Wow. And, and at this point, do you already know that you have PPROM? No. So, all right. So now we... We ended up leaving the doctor's office and I told him, I was like, I can't make a choice right now of what to do. Like I need time to process. I need to basically everything I learned in, in business, I applied to our fertility and pregnancy journey of just like how to make these big decisions, how to go through things, how to get the best information. And we went home and I started talking to people and crowdsourcing information and learning from other people. I got on calls with other moms. I was um, connected to this TTTS Facebook group. Um, And some of these women who I connected with are now some, still some of my closest friends in, in life and in business from, from going through all of this. And they helped me through this journey. I ended up connecting very quickly with another mom who actually like through Facebook, she was a patient of our doctors as well. And she walked me through her whole process and how she made decisions. Because when you're in these heightened moments of having to make like literal life or death decisions quickly, and now you have all of those emotions trying to get through it. Like I need, I need a voice of reason and someone who's like been through it and can talk me through their experience. And I remember asking her, I'm like, how did you make these decisions? Like, how do you do this? And there, there was this just voice inside of me saying, you know, I have to give both of my girls a chance. Like I have to. And that's what we did. We decided to do um, the laser ablation surgery, um, and we were trying to see if we could wait even a few more days because what I learned through all my research is the longer you can wait to even do that procedure, uh, the more likely they are to have the best chance. So we waited. It was almost a week later uh, when we had the surgery, and I had a very we had a very traumatic experience during the procedure. I won't share that, that the, all of that whole story, but it was a very traumatic procedure. And then at the end of the surgery, both girls still did have a heartbeat. And then the next morning, we went in for an ultrasound, and that's when we saw that um, we lost Emmy. She no longer had a heartbeat. 
but Molly, her still had a very strong heartbeat. And I just still remember in that moment, because at this point, after 17 weeks of pregnancy and having so many ultrasounds, like multiple mm-hmm. times a week, I could basically read these ultrasounds at this point. And I saw right when they, right when they were going to check heartbeats for both of the girls, like I just knew right away. But I remember I turned to my husband and I was crying and said, like, at least we just, we gave them both a chance. We tried. And for me, just knowing myself, I just had to, I knew I had to try and I had to do, you know, whatever we could do to try to give them the best chance. And that if they could fight and make it, they would. And then the next day is, or day and a half later is when I ruptured as a result of the surgery. So what that means is from the surgery, this laser ablation surgery, um, the doctor goes in with a tool that goes through the placenta, um, and the sac and the tool had essentially ruptured my sac. Oh, so at 17 and a half weeks, I started losing, we, I lost all my amniotic fluid. So oh we gosh. were told at that point, so we were rushed. I was texting the doctor, like pictures of what was leaking and everything is like, come back to the hospital. We're rushed back to the hospital. And I'm, I remember I'm literally like in a car and on Facebook, in the TTTS Facebook group sharing what's going on. And they, you know, other moms who had been through this said, join the PPROM Facebook group. That's for um, premature rupture of the membranes. And then shared in there what was going on and started connecting with these other moms who had similar things happen. And there were stories of hope and there were stories of survival, not all, but there were some. So, I'm at the hospital and they're telling me, you know, you're probably going to go into labor and deliver. And if you don't, we would, you're going to want to end this pregnancy because your baby's going to have no chance of survival. And here I am looking at my phone and seeing these stories of hope and survival. And it's like, what's the, what is the truth? Is there like, what makes sense? You know? And, and I'm like in this moment of just trying to problem solve as I'm experiencing everything And I just, you know, I remember like I'm holding my hands on my heart right now, even telling the story, but this was me for like weeks of just trying to like listen to my heart and listen to my body. And I just kept saying, you know, I just have to give her a chance. And if she's going to make it, she'll make it. And even though I have doctors telling me, I had a doctor say to me, Natalie, when I, when I didn't go into labor, like, don't you just want to start over? And don't you want to start fresh? I have doctors oh, say that to me. And I'm like, I have a living child inside of me. I just have to, I just have to give her a chance. And if she can make it, she will. And if she doesn't, at least I, at least I tried. And for me, that's, that's what I did. And that doesn't mean that's the right choice for everyone and sharing my story and what we went through. I, I share to just, you know, give hope that there is, there is a chance, but it it doesn't mean that will happen for everyone. And I saw it too, through these Facebook groups and on Instagram, there, there isn't always a happy ending, but there is, there is sometimes. And for me, I just had to try. And there was hope and you listened to your heart. You're always listening to your mind, but it sounds like you listened to your heart. Mm -hmm. So you listened to your heart and you decided, you, did you stay on bed rest at this point in the hospital with Molly until she was born? And how prematurely was she born? So now, um, you know, in the hospital, I haven't delivered. I'm essentially sent home now. And again, I'm now having to learn everything myself. I'm not getting the information from the hospital. I'm literally getting the information from other moms who have been through this. And there's a foundation, a nonprofit called the PPROM Foundation, where they have a whole protocol that you can try when you do rupture to, you know, give your baby the best chance. So here I am now being my own best advocate and, you know, Courtney, my business partner would call me like Dr. Carton, literally, because I'm learning everything and finding all the resources and all of the information. And I'm going back to my doctor at Columbia and I'm saying, here's what we're going to try because he didn't have the information. He didn't have the information on PPROM and, you know, these, all these babies being able to survive. I'm literally taking screenshots from this Facebook group and showing him the good news was he was willing to listen. And that's what's most important in finding a doctor is 
they, again, they might not know everything and don't, they might not have all these experiences, but if they're willing to listen and they're willing to help you advocate for the decisions that you want to make, that's what you really need. So I found all of this information on following this whole PPROM protocol and what to do and what not to do and was essentially on like modified bed rest at home up until 23 weeks. And at 23 weeks, I then went inpatient to uh, the hospital. I was at Columbia Presbyterian. They have a program there, um, the neonatal comfort care program, where they truly believe that, you know, every baby deserves the best chance at life, no matter how short that my life may be. Because a lot of the moms who are part of that program, they might already know that their baby just has zero chance of survival. For us, while the money at the doctors thought she had zero chance of survival, I knew she had some chance based on what I was seeing from other moms, but we didn't know. We didn't know. We just believed. And they have a whole program there to really help families and and help parents go through everything, um, especially if you choose to to continue the pregnancy and um, they have all of these amazing resources there at the hospital. So we were able to, I was able to stay inpatient for 11 weeks, 11 weeks. Yes. So from 23 weeks to 34 weeks. And then I was induced at 34 weeks and Molly was born premature, but healthy and happy. She was only on um, like breathing assistance for, I think it was not even a week. And came home from wow. the Nick came home from the NICU at 36 weeks. That's amazing. On her own. Also, it's amazing that you made it to 34 weeks mm-hmm. to delivery, right? Because I mean, you really, really did well for your body and you social media saved the day, really. It because really did. right, it helped you inform your decisions and you gave Molly the best shot possible. And I'm just I'm beyond impressed that you were able to go so long on a modified bed rest at home and your labor was almost to full term. I mean, that's amazing. Thank you. Look, and I was induced. Like I, I could have stayed pregnant longer. I don't know how much longer I would have obviously no idea how much longer I would have stayed pregnant, but I had no signs of, you know, going into labor or anything at that point. Um, at, when you are ruptured, you do have a very serious risk of infection. So, you know, I lived every mm-hmm. single day for 11 weeks being terrified of getting an infection and dying. Like that is a reality. And what was great about being able to be in the hospital, I was, I was very closely monitored. You know, my, my temperature was taken multiple times a day. Uh, we were doing the, I can't even remember what everything is called now four years later. The, uh, <laughs> all of the tests. I'm actually glad I don't remember everything now. <laughs> it's traumatic. Oh, I'm it so really glad is. you don't. It really is. Um, but I did everything that all of these other moms who were able to stay pregnant told me that they did. And then I made a whole resource list. So people reach out to me now, like, what did you do, Stephanie? Like, how did you do it? And I have a whole list now that I share with others because I just believe in, you know, paying it forward and helping everyone and doing whatever I can do to help others who might be going through this. It was not fun. It was not easy. I don't wish this experience on anyone, but it certainly shaped who I am now today. And just my my beliefs are are even stronger than than they ever were. And if somebody was looking for this guidebook, can they reach out to you? Or is this something that you have on one of your sites? Like where can someone find the information on preprom? on a pre-prom pregnancy? I would definitely advise going to the pre-prom website. There's a whole organization. So a lot of the resources that um, I followed, they're all on their website. Uh, I, if someone DMs me, like send me a DM on Instagram uh, and I'm happy to to connect one-on-one and just, you know, share more of my personal experience and, and story as well. I'm always happy to connect with people one-on-one because that's what helped me. You know, other women got on calls with me were texting with me were so, so helpful to help me get through everything. And I will always be there for anyone who needs help. So your fertility and pregnancy journey truly made you an advocate for women and women's health. Mm -hmm. So how do you, how do you support that today? I mean, I know, but tell our listeners, how do you support women today through your experience? 
outside of, of sharing pre-prom details? Yeah, well, on the health side, you know, the biggest thing that I do is continue to talk about and share our journey and story because I don't want anyone to ever have to feel alone, especially if they're in any of the sim- similar situations to to what we were in, because what really helped me get through was a community and was support. And then through our entrepreneurista community. So being able to share not only like our business journey and everything that's helped us grow and scale you know, multiple businesses, but so many of the women in our entrepreneurista community are also going through their own challenges, health challenges or fertility challenges and being able to be that resource and be a voice and just help make connections to have everyone have an, a little bit of an easier time than, than I did. <laughs> That was extremely rough, and you were certainly up for the challenge, but no one should have to go through that. That is so hard. Have your experiences informed at all how you parent Molly? Absolutely. My experiences have really shaped how I am as a mom. I learned just so much about health and wellness and taking care of our bodies and our mind and being able to instill that in Molly now from a very young age is so important. I feel like she's going to be way ahead of everything that it took me 30 plus years to learn. She now knows it for. Um, so it definitely has has shaped how I, how I parent her. You're also very vocal about your experience in losing Emmy Hope, who was Molly's twin. What do you do with Molly to honor Emmy? And how do you support other moms who have experienced loss and how they, they can honor their lost babies, children, mm-hmm. and, and, and? So losing Emmy was very challenging. You know, when you picture your life when you find out you're having twins and you don't expect it and then you visualize your whole life that way and then that change and and there's that loss there there's this just constant missing piece is how it how it felt and how it still feels but what we have done is always just continue to talk about her and even I mean from the time Molly was born I would talk about her of course she didn't understand what I was saying then but just having those conversations. So as we continue to have them, as she gets older, she will start to understand. And she does now. Um, we always have said good night to Emmy who lives in our heart every single night at bedtime. And, and we talk about her and she understands. And actually we were having a conversation about her this weekend because Molly loves to go to the park and loves to go on the swings. And I always, I ask a lot of, as you could tell, I ask a lot of questions. So I'm always asking Molly lots of questions. I'm like, what do you like most about going on the swing? She's like, I like how it feels to be in the air. I'd like to be able to, you know, feel like I'm going to touch the sky. And then she'll say things like, I know that Emmy is in the sky. And we have actually read a book. An entrepreneurista wrote a book about losing um, one of one of her twins. And it's a book that I that I read to Molly, the girl who lives in the sky. And Molly talks about it. And she We haven't made it something to be, you know, scared of or sad about. We celebrate her life and we include Emmy in in celebration. So it just feels like she's, she's part of, part of everything, but it's not easy. You know, I, I often will think like, oh my gosh, what would it, what would it be like if they were, if they were both here to be so awesome. Like I just visualize seeing both of them playing together when I see her playing by herself. Like I wish she had her sister, but you know, life is unpredictable and it's really hard. And I say all the time, everything is figure outable. Molly will say that to you as well, because I say it to her all the time, everything's figure outable. And yeah, it's not easy. Words of wisdom. But, yeah. <laughs> everything is figure outable. I like that. I'm going to borrow it. Do you see a correlation between your fertility pregnancy experience and how you show up for women through entrepreneurista? I do. I always, I always felt very like empowered in business and, you know, would take charge in business. And initially going through my journey with infertility, and I don't, don't even think we we talked about this part yet. I, I was like paralyzed with fear to talk about everything 
And it wasn't until I finally felt like I could share that this like weight was lifted off of my chest. And I finally felt I had that voice to be able to speak and to be able to share and to be able to learn when I was trying, when I was keeping everything in because I was so scared, that's when everything was really hard and really challenging. And like the early days of my fertility journey and in business, so much of what I talk to our entrepreneurs about is like, it's okay to reach out and ask for help. There's a community of people that are willing to help you. There's so many people that are willing to help. And Courtney and I saw that so early on in business, you know, we had mentors, we had advisors, we had people that wanted to help us, but you have to take that first step and reach out and ask for help. And same in, in going through a fertility journey or complicated pregnancy journey. Like you don't have to do it alone. There are people that will help you, that will guide you, that will be that resource for you. So you don't have to feel like you have that weight of the world on you. So I always say like my, my business journey prepared me for my fertility journey. My complicated fertility journey prepared me for my complicated pregnancy journey. And then now, you know, everything has prepared me for these, you know, multiple businesses that we've been able to build just by building our community and network and realizing that we don't know everything. It's okay to reach out and ask for help. And collectively together, we can all do so much more together in life and business for our health, physical health, mental health, everything. We're so much better together. Community is everything, isn't it? Right? It really it's, is. It's also from a mental health headspace perspective or mental health wellness. It really is what keeps us going because so much of business is sort of a mental element and it, it can be a big roadblock too. So I love, I love how you show up every single day for women and you've made a business of it. In your view, do you think the future of business is entrepreneurial as opposed to corporate? Yes. It has never been easier to start a business and build really the business you want for your life. You know, you could go get a corporate job making 50,000 a year, 100,000 a year, 200,000 a year. And you never know, you don't know if your job is safe. You don't know what's going to happen. You're not in control. But when you take charge and you start a business, you're in charge. You can be in control of your destiny and create the business and life that you want. And something I share all the time is, you know, there's, of course, there's unicorns out there, you know, Spanx and Canva and a lot of these, the like, huge billion dollar companies built by women, right? That doesn't mean that you have to go start a billion dollar business. You can start an awesome business that's taking care of the life that you want and having the control and freedom that you want, making $50,000 a year, $100,000 a year, a million dollars a year. You can control that. You can have the life that you want starting your own business. And it's never been easier with all of the tools and resources out that are out there. Communities like ours to be able to help empower and, in, and encourage those who are thinking about it, but they're not sure because they don't know how to do everything. Like we have all of those resources to make it easier. And look, starting a business is not for everyone. Like there, it is absolutely not for everyone. Not everyone should start a business, but if you want to, like if that's something you want to do, don't let being scared stop you because there are resources out there that to make it happen. Stephanie, what do you think the future of AI is for the entrepreneurial world? There is so much opportunity for founders that are leveraging AI right now. There are platforms like ChatGPT and so many others where you can be utilizing these tools to create so much content, to streamline processes, to write first drafts of really anything you need using using these tools, it is a huge time saver, but you just have to get in and start testing it out and figuring out how you can apply it to your business. But those who are not using AI in their business will definitely be left behind for sure. Interesting. And does Entrepreneurista offer any sort of tutorial on how to leverage AI? You know, we should definitely do a virtual event. So thank you for the idea to do a virtual event to share how we're using it and recommendations for how others can use it too. Especially when it comes to marketing, there is so much opportunity to be leveraging a lot of these tools from creating videos, content. There's 
there's a lot of uh, time saving happening from ChatGPT. How did you and Courtney meet? And how do the two of you keep your business partnership solid? Courtney and, I, Courtney and I met through a mutual friend who is also an entrepreneurista back in, oh my gosh, it was back in 2010, early 2010. And we became friends first before we were business partners. And we got very lucky that we both happened to have opposite skill sets, but we had the same vision and what we in what we wanted to build. And the reason why we are still best friends and business partners to this day and have started other businesses together is because we focused on building building and nurturing our friendship and business relationship. And we invested in working with coaches and joined groups and, you know, did all the things that you need to do to, to build a relationship and a business partnership, almost like a marriage, right? When you have a business partnership, it is like a marriage. So we did all the things and continue to do them. And that's what's made our partnership flourish over the years. And that I do have written resources for. We have written posts on the best ways to find a great business partner and have a great business partnership. So I can give you that link to share for sure, Natalie. <laughs> I would love that. So Stephanie, what's next for you? What's next? The next meeting, the next year, the next uh, 10 no, years? What's, what's, <laughs> what's the next, what's the next venture? The next, yeah. what's your eye on the prize next? Like, what are you doing next? I feel like I know, yes, every single day is full of nexts for you. And I love that you do it with such a sunny spirit and such a great you know, attitude about life. I mean, it's, it's amazing because you've been through so much. So tell me what is next for you in the scheme of your next big business venture, if you can even share. Our focus right now is really on building Entrepreneurista to be the best resource and community for founders. That is our focus right now. Um, if you know me and Courtney, we've started multiple businesses over the years. And, you know, Courtney runs our agency business, Social Fly. We've started an angel investing uh, platform. Uh, we're involved in other business ventures as well. So we're not starting any new business ventures right now. We are staying focused, which is advice that we advice that we give to lots of founders. So yeah, we find us over in the Entrepreneurs Elite community and we're here to help support any founders looking to launch, grow, and scale a business. Well, I will share all of the accomplishments in the show notes so everybody knows all of the things that you founded alongside of Courtney, because the two of you are amazing partners in crime, not crime. Actually, you just are amazing partners, and it's truly miraculous. I'm going to check out all of those notes because I've had business partners in my past, and it doesn't always work out so, you know, marvelously. So anyway... Stephanie, I want to thank you so much for joining me today on All Over Again podcast. Is there any parting words? Are there any parting words that you would like to share with listeners today? Well, Natalie, thank you so much for having me and giving me the opportunity to share share my story because my mission truly is to just help make impact and help women, founders and friends that are going through their own journeys and experiences. And if I can just help one person not feel alone, that's that's what I'm here to do and, and here to help. So thank you for creating this platform to, to help share so we can can all help each other. My parting words, you know, what I would probably tell myself 10 years ago that I wish I knew is it will all work out and it will be okay. And just keep going, just keep going forward. So just reach out ask for help and, and never be, never be scared to ask for help. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Those are truly words of wisdom. And in my head, repeating right now are Dory's words and finding Nemo just keep swimming, just, just keep, keep swimming. swimming. Yes. Right. Yes. 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 So yes. Let's keep swimming. Let's Thank keep you swimming. so much, let's Stephanie. Thank you, Natalie. <laughs>